Welcome to the third section of the course. It's time to begin our course project and develop a real-life API. This section will be dedicated to Express.js, the most famous Node.js framework. We will take advantage of its strengths and attempt to remedy its weaknesses, but the most important takeaway from this section is that conventions and best practices are important even in the context of a framework that leaves us with much freedom into how we approach things. One of the most common mistakes Node.js developers make is that they omit controllers. MVC remains the most efficient way of building web APIs, and Express.js is not an exception. Just by following a few simple techniques, we can boost our productivity, limit bugs, and write better, more presentable code with Node and Express. But before getting down to the nitty-gritty details, let's first focus into what we will be building throughout the rest of the course we will be building a subscription management application. What's the use for such an app? Well, imagine that you are selling an online service that users have to pay monthly fees to use. Instead of storing the plans, the subscription, and the payment details on your own, it would be nice if a third-party service existed that could take care of all that for you. Of course, this is by no means an original idea, but it is a great example of an application that can start off small and grow over time. That is why we need to lay some solid foundation when we write the first few lines of code in a project like that. Obviously, this is an online course and we have limited time, so here are the most important parts of the functionality that we want to implement. We want users to be able to create accounts in our service. We want users to store subscription plans that they make available to their customers. We want them to be able to store subscriptions based on those plans. And finally, we want to be responsible for charging the end users. Let's get started. I'm going to open up a terminal in order to initialize our npm installation and begin by installing Express.js. It's going to take some time. The next step, of course, will be to get started with the entry point. The entry point is the first file that we are going to call in order to initialize the server and get things bootstrapped. So I'm going to call this server.js. Other names usually are app.js or index.js. I personally prefer the name server. In this file, we need to require the express library. And next, I'm going to configure the port number. Now, we may want to provide the port number via an environmental variable or use the default value, which I'm going to use 3000. Then we can begin by enabling the application and listening to that port number. Also, printing a message so that the end user, the one calling the API, knows the port in which it's running. So, the very basics are here. Our server is running if we attempt to call and start this file. Now, I'm going to create a folder called controllers and inside that I'm going to place the plans controller and later the subscriptions controller. Now, how do controllers work? Controllers work via the use of the express router. You see, most developers make the mistake of defining all routes in the server.js file. This is ineffective. It can quickly get out of hand. Your server.js file can quickly turn huge. So the best practice is to take advantage of the express router, which offers various useful features. The first one is that you can define the paths without supplying the full paths. So for example, let's say that the path to any action related to the plans model is called slash API slash plans. Well, we could go on and add that prefix in all of the routes, but that would be repeating ourselves. So, to keep ourselves dry, I am just going to assume that this prefix has been dealt with from the caller, from the one that's using this controller, this router, and just implement four routes. Get with no ID, get with ID for returning a single plan, post and delete. And of course, don't forget to export the router. Then we can go on back to the server.js, import the router from that file as plans controller, even though it's not technically a controller, it's not a class inheriting from something. But 
it's just a router. And then we can go on and say apt use, include the prefix, and by doing so, all of the four routes will receive this prefix by default. And then I'm just going to include the plans controller, which is no more than a the router. Therefore, this is going to be slash appy slash plans. This is slash appy slash plans with the ID. This is API slash plans, but it's a post request, so I'm just going to include it prefix the comment with the post keyword and this is a delete action so let me include the get action to these two don't forget the http verb and our controller seems ready to go before we move on to creating the subscription controller there's one extra step that we can take in order to ensure that we have clean code and we do not repeat ourselves we are going to create an async wrapper to wrap this request handler that we pass as the second argument to all our paths. Now, this is going to be part of the utilities folder because it's a helper function that's used throughout the rest of the project. I'm going to call this async-wrapper.js and in here I'm going to place this very simple implementation of a wrapper function. The async wrapper takes a first and only argument, a function, which is going to be the actual request handler, and wraps it with a call to catch. Now, what does this mean? It means that any error that happens inside that function will be caught and passed to the first error handling middleware that we supply to express.js. So how do we use it? We go back to our controller and require it using typical Node.js syntax. Let's make this lowercase. And then we can go to our request handler callback and wrap it with async wrapper. This allows the request handler to be async and also it allows it to be free of error handling code. So at this point, we do not have to include try cats blocks or rejection checks for promises. All those are responsibilities of the error handling middleware, not of the request handler. And this is where async wrapper will be proven to be extremely useful. But notice that we no longer have IntelliSense. VS Code doesn't know that request and response are actually express request and response objects because we've wrapped them in another function. So I'm going to go back to the utilities folder and create a type definition file. This is actually TypeScript, but it is extremely helpful for what we want to do. I'm going to import the request handler type, which is the type of a callback function we pass in every route we define using express. And I'm just going to say that the function we pass to async wrapper is a request handler. Now, if we go back to our controller, we can see that IntelliSense is back and we can access all properties of the request and response objects. And then I can go on and make every request handler async. An added bonus to all of that is that we don't have to care about the response sent to the end user. Unless, of course, the response is the regular 200. For a bad request response, we will be throwing an error that when caught by the error handler that we will define in the next video, it will return the appropriate error code. The controller doesn't need to know about all that. I'm just going to copy and paste the logic over to the subscriptions controller since there's nothing special in this implementation. The endpoints are just placeholders for what's to follow. And then back to the server.js file, I can import it and include it in the project using app.use. And just like that, we have made the first steps to creating this application. There's still a very long way to go into establishing conventions and best practices, so stay tuned.